Welcome from Lorraine and I to everyone watching our Sunday morning service from North Timmouth Community Church. And welcome to any friends that may also be watching on our YouTube channel. Our theme today is Why Did God Give Us the Holy Spirit? And our Bible passage is John 14, verses 15 to 27. There is also a playlist of five YouTube choruses so that you can worship the Lord with us. We know that holding services uh, on the internet is not the same as actually meeting together for worship and fellowship. But I hope that you will understand why this is our only option in these present circumstances. Fortunately, God is not similarly locked down, and we believe that he is working away beyond behind the scenes to bless us and to bring good out of even this sad and difficult situation. Shall we begin with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us with an everlasting love and that you are always working for our good. We thank you for your beautiful creation and for making mankind in your own image. We praise you that you love the world so much that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our saviour and Lord, to die on the cross, to rescue us from sin and death and to give us eternal life. We thank you also for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be our counsellor and teacher, to help us in our Christian lives and to empower us to share the gospel of Christ. Dear Holy Spirit, we pray that you will fill us this morning so that we are able to praise and worship God from the heart and to learn more about your wonderful work amongst us. In the precious name of Jesus, Amen. When Jesus left this earth and returned to his Father in heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper. But what were his reasons for sending the Holy Spirit? And what is his relevance for us as present-day believers? To attempt to answer these questions, we are going to consider a portion of what is referred to as the Upper Room Discourse, recorded in the, in the second half of John 14. This wonderful and intimate teaching of Jesus was given to the disciples during the Last Supper and before his arrest and crucifixion, and concerns this very issue. So Lorraine is going to read the scriptures to us. <clears throat> if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you, in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you, will, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. 
My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the counsellor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Thank you. Let me give some background first. From the opening verse of the Old Testament, we read that the Holy Spirit was active in creation, along with the Father and the Son. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given to certain people, chosen by God, to anoint and equip them for their particular role as prophet, priest or king, etc. However, it was prophesied by the prophet Joel that later the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all God's people. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit occurred on the day of Pentecost, 10 days after Jesus' ascension. The prophecy of Joel was quoted by Peter at the beginning of his first great sermon, the first sermon of the Christian church, when 3,000 people responded to the gospel message. So to whom is the Holy Spirit given? The gift of the Holy Spirit is for those who love Jesus and obey his commands, that is, for those who have genuinely accepted Christ as their Saviour and Lord. If you love me, you will obey my command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. The phrase, another counsellor, brings to mind the names given to the future Messiah in Isaiah 9, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. For three years, Jesus had been a wonderful counsellor, teacher, companion, and friend to, the, to his disciples. And when he returned to heaven, God would send another counsellor, just like Jesus, to teach them all things and to remind them of everything that Christ had taught them. This was of crucial importance because it ensured that the gospel writers would faithfully and accurately record Jesus' life, death, resurrection and teaching. Throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, the Holy Spirit had been with the disciples through Jesus, who was filled with the Holy Spirit without limit. But Jesus' promise was that the Holy Spirit would be in them, actually living within their hearts. I in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. A position of spiritual oneness between the Holy Trinity and Christ's disciples. This would be an even closer relationship than their experience with Jesus for the three years of his earthly ministry, which is why he told them 
that it was for their benefit that he was going away so that he might send the Holy Spirit to them. How blessed are we to have the spirit of our heavenly father and the Lord Jesus living in our hearts. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. My peace I give you. Jesus encouraged his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This seemed almost impossible for them since they knew that Jesus was leaving them and that awful events were about to happen. Also, Peter had been told that he would deny Christ three times and the other disciples would desert Christ. Similarly, it seems almost impossible for us not to be troubled or afraid in this, in this present world of trouble and strife, especially in a pandemic. But Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, offers us his peace that the world cannot give, his very own peace that kept him calm, courageous, and resolute, even amidst the terrible events around his trial and crucifixion. This is the peace of God that passes all understanding, that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How do we receive this peace? Well, like Jesus, we receive the peace of God through earnest prayer and by the Holy Spirit. Lorraine is going to now lead our prayers of intercession. <clears throat> Father God, please forgive us for all the times that we choose darkness over light and for all those things we have done that have made our world what it is today, for better and for worse. Thank you for your love, compassion and mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for suffering the judgment that we all deserved and for our salvation. We truly look forward to the day when you will return to finish your work and establish your will here on earth. Holy Spirit, we call upon your name to fill us as our Lord Jesus promised and ask that you will help us to keep watch and stay alert in these dangerous times. Please enable us to seek God's presence and grow in faith by following your guidance and making every effort to walk in the ways of our Lord Jesus. Please give us the strength, courage and determination that we need to face all that is coming. Lord, we are out of our depth with all those who are suffering, dying and grieving right now, and so we lift them up to you to comfort and to heal. Without you, we are nothing. But if it is your will, please intervene and bring this pandemic to an end soon. Our world leaders, politicians, scientists and medics are all doing their best to fight this virus. But only you can stop it in its tracks and stop the devastation it is causing. The power of life and death are in your hands alone. We pray that you will heal our sick and deliver us all from this terrible disease. We ask that you bring rest and peace to our exhausted key workers, especially those in healthcare who are struggling and under tremendous pressure physically and psychologically. We lift up all those who are lonely, isolated, distressed, and all the victims of abuse, and ask that you help them in their need. We pray for hope for the elderly living alone or in homes, the children who cannot go to school, the unemployed, the poor, the homeless, all of those who have lost jobs, businesses and security. We lift, lift up your church across the world, Lord, and we pray that no one will be lost and that you will increase your people's hope, faith and trust in you. We thank you for all our answered prayers and for the overwhelming examples 
that surround us, of you, you working in our lives and in the world around us. We praise you, Lord. Lord, we pray that people from every nation will realise their vulnerability and need for you at this time and that they will find effective ways of seeking and finding you. We pray for opportunities to share our faith, even in lockdown. We know that you are with us forever, always listening, always working your purposes out and bringing good out of all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we lift up all our prayers to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'll shift over a bit. So now we're asking, how does the Holy Spirit help us today in our Christian lives? The Holy Spirit helps us in every aspect of our Christian lives to worship God, to love our fellow believers, to grow to be more like Jesus, to serve one another in love and to share the gospel of Christ. Firstly, he enables us to worship God in spirit and in truth. In spirit, because the Holy Spirit joins with our spirit to worship God from the heart. In truth, because the spirit of truth reveals to us the truth about God. Secondly, he enables us to love each other as Christ loved us by pouring God's love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God's love reassures us in our inmost being that we are his children, loved and cherished by him, in spite of the fact that we often let him down. We all need to know this unconditional and abiding love deep in our hearts then we will be able to love others with the same love that we have received. Thirdly, he helps us to grow in our discipleship by helping us to understand the Bible, to pray to God and to become, and to become more and more like Christ. He helps us to understand the Bible since Although the Bible was written by human authors, the Holy Spirit is its true author, the one who inspired the various human authors. Therefore, we should always read scripture slowly and carefully, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth that God wants us to understand. And he will show us new things every time even in familiar Bible passages. Of course, it is right to use good Bible study notes to aid our understanding, and God does speak to us through these notes. But first, we should allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us directly from his word. When he does, we take his word deeper into our hearts, remember it more, and are far more likely to put it into practice. As Hebrew 4 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Next, he helps us to pray, especially when we have no idea what to pray. Sorry, I've lost my place. Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with God's will, which is also what J Jesus meant when he told us to pray in his name. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Of course, this is not a blank check to receive anything that we ask for, like a new Porsche. But it does mean that God will give us what we ask for within his will and purpose. 
And this is precisely how the Holy Spirit helps us. Lastly, the Holy Spirit helps us to become more like Christ, which after all is the ultimate goal of discipleship, to become like the Master. As 2 Corinthians 3 says, and we who all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Fourthly, he helps us to serve God in others by giving us the gifts of the Spirit, different but complementary gifts for each of us. And in order that we will use these gifts in the right spirit, that is, in love, the Holy Spirit produces within our character the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The gifts of the Spirit are not to be used for selfish purposes or for self-aggrandizement, as in the Corinthian church, but in order to build each other up in love so that we all reach unity and maturity in Christ. Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 13 that no matter how great our gifts our knowledge, our good deeds, and our sacrifice, they are all worthless without love. A church without love is unattractive and off-putting to everyone, including Christ. So we need to make sure that our thoughts, words, and deeds are all motivated by God's love. Then they will be a gracious blessing to everyone including Christ. Finally, he empowers us in our Christian witness. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. With the Holy Spirit's help, we can share the gospel with clarity and conviction, but also with sensitivity and respect. As Peter tells us, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. The power of the Holy Spirit is also given for effective preaching, as in Peter's first sermon. The Holy Spirit enables God's word to be proclaimed both powerfully and lovingly. In turn, we are blessed by hearing God's word if we take it to heart and act on it in our lives. Anyone listening to a spirit-led sermon and genuinely seeking the Lord will be drawn to Christ as they are convicted by the Holy Spirit, as happened remarkably on the day of Pentecost. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other disciples, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's draw some conclusions. It must have been wonderful to be one of Christ's original disciples, following him around Judea and Galilee and helping him in his ministry. When he ascended back into heaven, Jesus did not leave his disciples as orphans, but came to them by the Holy Spirit. Similarly, when we ask Christ into our lives as Saviour and Lord, he comes into our lives by his Holy Spirit. So, once again, what is the Holy Spirit like? Well, he's a wonderful counsellor, teacher, companion and friend, just like Jesus. 
and he helps us in our worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry and mission, just like Jesus. If we love Christ and obey his commands, then we are loved by both the Father and the Son, and they come to live within our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What an incredible and wonderful promise and reality. Oh, and I nearly forgot. When it is our time to leave this earth, Jesus will come back again to take us to be with him in his father's house. Then we will be like Jesus and will see him face to face. We will live with him for all eternity in the beautiful new Jerusalem, where there will be no more sin, no more evil, no more suffering to spoil our lives, no more barriers, no pretense, no wrong motives, just genuine and loving relationship with God and with each other in his perfect and joyous new creation. Hallelujah. Shall we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for all your many blessings that are ours through faith in Jesus, who died and rose again to save us. Thank you that when Jesus returned to sit at your right hand in heaven, you sent the Holy Spirit to live within the heart of every believer. Thank you that by your grace, we are born again of your Holy Spirit. And that he lives within us to help us in every part of our Christian life and ministry. May we know love and serve the Lord, and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, become more and more like him. May we desire to be led by and filled with the Holy Spirit each day, to the glory of the Lord Jesus and our Heavenly Father. Amen. Shall we share the blessing together? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.